between human rights and nationalism, memory, recognition, and multiculturalism from a critical perspective. Leah? Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you for having me and thank you for inviting me. This is uh, such a great opportunity actually for me because I'm so used to uh, talking into uh, academic conferences and here we have a mixture of many different uh, uh, people who are positioned uh, differently. So I think this is going to be um, the real thing and I'll tell you what I mean by this. Uh, it is uh, really a, an interesting combination, so to use this uh, a neoliberal management language, you know, to have so many different stakeholders here. We have people who are researchers, we have people who are uh, memory activists, we have, I guess, people who are uh, maybe embedded in the structures of this municipality, we have people who are within this uh, uh, institute, uh, maybe we have someone also who is uh, a, a carrier of different kinds of memory. So what is important is to recognize as the first thing that we have different positions here and we have different agendas here. So to start this uh, presentation, I want to uh, say or to come clean and to say I'm a sociologist and I'm a researcher. This is important because it defines actually the lenses through which I actually understand human rights, uh, uh, memorization processes, uh, genocide and other issues. It doesn't mean that I neglect uh, or deny other positions, but this is my position and through this I'm going to talk about. So, um, generally, uh, I wanted to start off by picking up some of the notions that I managed to understand through my very uh, but fastly improving Swedish. Uh, so just to bring together those notions of uh, multiculturalism and the whole actually neighborhood in which we are actually having this conference, also migration and memory as three may maybe major topics uh, that we are trying to discuss. Uh, here. So, of course, I'm not, of course, but here it comes. I'm not an expert in uh, migration. But yet, I want to say some things that I think are important for this lecture and to understand actually this uh, particular uh, way in which we understand memory and memorization processes. So, when we talk about uh, multiculturalism, what we are talking about. You know, th this is one of those big words that you can fill in with whatever you want. You can take it as something, you know, most beautiful, but you can also see through it a huge threat to a, a texture of a society. So it depends actually how we address it and what do we put inside, what is the content, uh, content of it. Uh, of course, when we talk about migration and the changes uh, in uh, uh, social structures and texture, I mean, we need to pay attention to all kinds of processes that are happening, uh, you know, not only uh, with the uh, influx of different cultures, different religions, but also uh, different generations, different uh, uh, memories that are bringing. So they're kind of roughly speaking, there are two different set of narratives. One is this that we all want and we inspire, and this is someone mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning of this day, this European dream of you know, human rights, multiculturalism, everything that died pr approximately 20 years ago, I would say. But still, this is something that is kind of foundations of this uh, uh, European narrative. So this is this idea as multiculturalism as Benetton. You know, you have all, all those beautiful, different people. You see them in one picture. They all look aesthetic. They all look nice. They all are the best friends there, you know. So this is kind of aspiration. So this is a Benetton image of this uh, multicultural society. On the other hand, we have uh, this other picture that multiculturalism actually says something that we need to 
actually we as societies that are accepting or us as people who are actually emigrating to different societies, there has to be some kind of negotiation. And actually by the fact that you're coming here, you're taking something from me. So it's always kind of a game in which someone is losing something. So uh, this is, of course, a more realistic scenario, and this is what we are experiencing. So from here, I want to move and to talk about something that actually I know more about, which is uh, memory and memorization processes. And I want to ask a set of different questions. First of all, in the whole lecture, I mean, I have no idea what am I going to use out of this uh, presentation because I want to actually connect to the themes that are relevant to this specific uh, uh, public and audience. Uh, but I want to, if there is one thing out of this lecture that I want you to take out is how we ended up thinking about memorization processes the way we do. So why? We had this conversation here about memory and uh, about uh, you know, all those aspects of memory, but it feels like we started this conversation in the middle. Why it matters? Why, how come that we think it matters? It matters to whom? So, you know, I want us to go several steps back and to rethink the whole issue uh, from a critical perspective and also to see what are the clear downsides actually of the ways in which ethics is today uh, kind of linked uh, to memory. And uh, Professor Carlson mentioned uh, ethics at the beginning, and I'm going to touch uh, this also in my presentation, because I think it is very important to understand that ethics is not something that is static. It is developing, it is changing, and it is changing through politics. And often politics is actually changing our moral standards as well the other way around. So I have um, a list of questions that I want to touch upon at some point. So why memory matters and to whom? Uh, does it matter to label human rights atrocity as a genocide? We take it for granted that it matters, but I, I can assure you that this is a valid question, especially if you come from sociology. So you should ask those questions, who, why it matters to say this is a genocide and not uh, um, atrocity or ethnic cleansing. What are those, those hierarchies are telling us actually about political situation and political actors of those who are promoting those claims? This is very, very important to understand. As we can take it now to Ukraine, does it matter? Is it going to be easier for people who are suffering now if we label that as a genocide? Of course, genocide uh, has at least four different um, ways through which we can understand it. First is, of course, legal. Uh, the, the, we all know uh, Raphael Lemkin and how he actually managed to, although this was also a negotiation, by the end of the day, what we understand today in a legal terms as genocide, it is not completely what he wanted to achieve there. And we know how Soviet uh, Union at that point uh, was actually negotiating to take out uh, the political aspect of it. Again, this is one way to understand it. Second way to understand genocide is, of course, so sociological, where the idea is not to find uh, who is a culprit uh, in, in, uh, in a genocide, but to understand processes that actually led uh, to, uh, to actually the excessive uh, uh, use of force, such as um, genocide. Then we have a political application or a political understanding of genocide. You know, when we have uh, uh, polit parliaments are saying, oh, we pronounce that what happened in uh, 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 Turkey at the beginning of the last century was actually a genocide, Armenian genocide. Or we have, uh, I don't know, parliament in uh, Australia or in Serbia saying Srebrenica was a genocide. So that process that can be linked to a legal process, but it can be completely not linked to legal process. So that's third thing. And fourth thing, as, as you pointed out in the morning and in my uh, very fluent Swedish, I understood that 
ethics, how we can understand actually genocide through ethical lenses. So this is completely different layer of understanding it and understanding exactly what you said, actually, that it is not an ended event. Because even if we have an absence of violence, we actually still have uh, the genocide going on in the minds of people who suffered it, either, either through uh, memories, traumas, uh, their families, uh, the absence of home, etc., etc. Et so there are many ways to understand it. Now, um, I hope I will going to touch, I'm touching already, so it's, don't be afraid, it's not going to be endless presentation. So, uh, what is the connection between human rights, genocide and victimhood? I think it is very important to understand it because so far those, the notion of uh, victimhood was very pronounced uh, in an uh, ideology of nationalism. But if we think about what happened, and the whole point of this lecture is to show you, as I said, how we ended up thinking about memorization processes today as we do, and I will show you that we all around the globe have very, very similar perceptions of what is supposed to be, what is this moral remembrance, what should happen, how we should remember those atrocities. But I will show you also the downsides of this, and it is, uh, again, once my previous, previous uh, supervisor told me, you know, when you're in academia, it's not a de detective novel, you can say your punchline in the first sentence. So the idea is that actually human rights promoted this notion that victim is a new hero. So this is super important, because once you have this as a card, it means that Oh my God! We all want to be we want to be victims because there is something uh, to trade off. There is something we can earn, we can get uh, out of it. And finally, what is the nexus uh, between ethics of memory and politics? So those are some small questions I I want to cover. <laughs> okay, but before that, I just want to make it not as a regular lecture but just to invite you to make it as a discussion. It's a difficult hour, we are tired, so, you know, it is easier if we all talk. I promise you I will not fall asleep during this lecture, but I cannot say that for you, so if you want to <laughs> ask, no, if you want to ask some questions that are really relevant and you want to put them on the, on the agenda to start with, I mean, again, this is, this is the time you should use to understand issues that are relevant to this community, okay? So I'm opening this, so I will... <laughs> if you have questions, just... First, I'm very thankful to this country with me in Sweden. Actually, I'm coming from the Middle East. A country, a, a lot of country which Country fighting with another country, nationality with fighting with another nationality. Most of them don't believe on democracy. Most of them want, who had the power, want to take for the other. And uh, here in Sweden, I can feel peace, peace in this country. I'm very thankful to Swedish uh, society, which gave this opportunity to me and to my children to grow up in this. Uh, my question is, what we can do uh, in the future or uh, <laughs> to those who came in from other community, other nationality, if someone, some of them have uh, some background, <laughs> sorry for my English, my English is very <laughs> low. Uh, what, what can we do to, to uh, those facts, to, to, to make those facts together, to be new things? I mean, what can we do against these regimes? For example, still, still, one, some people, some Erdogan, he, 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 he said that Swedish government uh, 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 giving the uh, place to terrorists, which is not 
Correct. Okay, let's let's. Uh, I, I understand your question. I hope that by the end of this lecture, you will see that I will have a list of of what not to do. What to do is like uh, you have another another day for that. So that's uh, is going to be solved tomorrow. Uh, yes. I would like to ask if you think that um, is not, not uh, the, the the emergence of human rights victimology has something to do with uh, the end of the Soviet uh, Union, meaning that uh, when you have a world that is good, a system that is the final system at the end of history. Um, the the only way to you know the only way to 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 make resistance to the system is to say that you were a victim that it can be corrected. You cannot be against the system as such. There are no like outside position, but the only possible political position in a self good world is the victims. Okay, let's. We will get to it. I don't think it has to do because it was uh, it, uh, the position of victimhood and human rights actually developed previous to that. There is some uh, link to uh, the Cold War uh, and how actually the understanding of uh, communism uh, within uh, uh, communism versus uh, fascism in that sense. But it, it, it is a later development. Okay, I say whenever you want to stop me, just stop and we can have uh, this conversation. But I just want to bring us to this point to, to uh, actually what I promised to just to answer you to like 105 questions that they had. So, no, yes, okay. We don't hear it. Unerwartet sinkt Brandt während der Zeremonie auf die Knie. Der Kniefall von Warschau. Das Bild geht um die Welt. Okay, needless to say, this is 1970 uh, German uh, Chancellor. Yeah, uh, Willy. Yeah, die war. Fand ich. Yeah, you, uh, Willy Brandt, who is uh, coming this, to this uh, ghetto Warschau, and he is uh, kneeling there, and this is like probably one of the biggest catharsic moments uh, that uh, the, you know uh, brought us so many other apologies across the globe uh, and uh, uh, became implemented in what is going to become later on known as transitional justice something that is very important that you know uh, states should apologize for uh, the past uh, wrongdoings now, if we move forward something like 35 years, no, 30, 45 years, no, no, In uh, 2015, uh, some will uh, recognize this uh, uh, when uh, Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic came to Srebrenica on the 20th anniversary to actually apologize for the crimes uh, Serbian uh, forces uh, committed uh, on the Bosniak uh, uh, population, uh, what is known today as Srebrenica genocide. Uh, he came and what happened actually there uh, he was uh, heavily stoned, uh, his uh, glasses were broken, and he went out uh, from this event as a hero because he could claim that he was the ultimate victim of this uh, event, actually. So, just to be sure, he was heavily, heavily pressured by the international community to actually uh, come there and apologize. So, uh, this is just to show this beginning Sorry, this beginning, uh, how come that we have so many uh, very similar 
uh, practices all around the globe. Again, this is just uh, one tiny example, but uh, public and official apologies, we can see it's, there is also great literature about it uh, from Canada, Australia, uh, Sweden, Ireland. I mean, you just name it, uh, you know, politicians or someone ap apologized for some kind of uh, uh, crimes committed in the past because it is very trendy. It is uh, part of this, uh, what we understand today, morality of, of, uh, memor uh, of uh, remembrance. So to that end, I invented this uh, nice um, um, uh, name, a moral remembrance, uh, and I tried actually to trace historically to see how we ended up having this human rights memorialization agenda. So this is important because this agenda is directly link, uh, linked to the appearance uh, of, uh, of the uh, human rights. And what I say actually that this agenda is grounded in uh, the most basic presumptions in human rights and transitional justice, that proper memorialization is essential for healing societies with a difficult past and moving beyond uh, trauma and violence, that proper memorialization is a crucial step in establishing moral responsibility for past atrocities, and that proper memorialization can guarantee the establishment of human rights values and can bring to reconciliation. So just to be clear, if you feel that any of you is not operating under one of uh, all of those three presumptions, please raise your hand. I would like to see if someone would think that something here is not logical. Although I will show you in this lecture that this makes no sense. Okay, so we are used to think about this. We are, I want to show you that in this situation, when we talk about memory and memorialization, we are like this elephant that has this chain. We are used to uh, um, thinking in a certain way about certain things, but even if they take this chain off, we will still be, still be standing there without any option to actually move, because this is how much those presumptions reduced our ability to reimagine future of the past in different way, if that makes sense. Uh, so generally, I wanted to understand uh, in the book that I was referencing here a book, I'm not going to talk about all those issues, but uh, why we think the way we think about memorialization, this is, I want to talk about this tomorrow. Does this moral remembrance, we, which is the human rights memorialization agenda, have the potential to transform individuals in local communities into believer, believers in human rights values and norms? So here is, this is important for you as a community, because if we take it uh, for granted that if we do X, Y, Z, so we have this proper way to deal with the past, so we do actually as pres prescribed, we will end up having new generation of people who are believers or or tend to believe more in human rights. Sorry to tell you, but my, the results of my book show actually that that is not the case. Not that it is not the case, but actually we see uh, a trend that is opposite to that, that we see actually people who are consuming uh, projects uh, that belong to this moral remembrance are becoming more prone to nationalism due to all kinds of uh, matters. I, can, I will not be able to talk about it now because it is very um, it's lecture in itself. And what are some side effects that moral remembrance produces on the ground? So I will just mention this very, very briefly. And I have uh, four major claims that moral remembrance, uh, remembrance clashes with the nation state sponsored memorialization agenda, that moral remembrance strengthens the categories of nation, nation and ethnicity, meaning as more as we put effort actually to do this human rights memorialization agenda, we are getting something that is completely opposite. Not only that, we are getting also some positive effects, but I'm not uh, uh, talking about positive things in this lecture. And moral remembrance uh, uh, produces new social inequalities. This is very important. This is very important for this community, because if you are contemplating, let's say, to have a... Uh, 
a memorial to some uh, group of migrants, you're actually immediately, immediately building hierarchies and actually uh, making, uh, um, marking the boundaries of a political struggle between those communities, because once you have uh, one s set of memories recognized, you're actually excluding all the others, other groups, uh, and uh, it is just, uh, you know, hierarchies uh, uh, that are going to appear and are going to be uh, uh, apparent in this uh, political struggle in the years to come. Um, Moral remembrance does not make people more appreciative of human rights. This is very um, depressing, I have to say. It is. That was, uh, I didn't know that I will get that. Okay. So uh, how I define this moral uh, remembrance, this is a standard I set of norms based on human rights value. In that sense, it is a generative process of standardization of memory at the global world level. That's why it doesn't matter if you're here or you're somewhere you know, uh, uh, far, far away uh, through those linkages and institutions of human rights. We have almost... Uh, the same notions of what is this proper memory, how we should remember the past. So, you know, there is this bad way to remember it, and we can talk also about it, but there is this right way to remember it. And if we do all, all the steps, yes, we are going to land on a, you know, this... Uh, we will heal the nation. There is no such a thing as healing the nation. Nations are no people. You don't heal nations. This is, again, how we apply this vocabulary, uh, psychological vocabulary, actually, uh, that sounds good. That are, we, It's all about catchy phrases, but it has nothing to do with research. It has nothing to do with actually what happens on the ground. Uh, healing the nation is, uh, is uh, in, an invention, and it is also a nice construct. You know, it is uh, at the level of never again. Let's do it now, all, uh, all of us together, seven times never again, it will never happen. No, it will happen, because it makes no... I mean, it, it has nothing to do with the actually sociological processes that are happening on the ground. You know, even if uh, individual is not the same, not even, if individual is not the same, as a society, and we need to take that into account. Now, it defines the proper ways in which uh, societies are supposed to deal with the legacies of uh, mass human rights abuse. This is what we are talking about here today. The guiding principle is to force states to face and become accountable for the past human rights abuses. So in that sense... Mm, NGOs are dealing that, museums are, are doing that, uh, institutes like this are doing that. We are teaching in universities, we are trying to find, you know, transitional justice, peace building, you name it. All those, you know, big, big paradigms are all directed into, to achieve actually this goal. And here I'm coming to actually what is this content of moral remembrance and this is uh, actually i think the most important uh, thing to understand and this is how to understand how come that we all ended up having uh, the same notions about what is the proper way to uh, remember uh, i'm talking uh, in detail in this book about three very different, uh, historically speaking, uh, sociological processes that overlapped at some point. But today we cannot remember this moral remembrance or the human rights memorization agenda without actually those three uh, principles that became kind of uh, bedrocks of, of the foundations, actually, of whatever, what, whatever we are talking about here. We di didn't mention this, but it was all there in any of our presentations, and I'm sure also those in Swedish. I don't know, but I'm sure it was also there. So I'm talking about this process of facing the past. This is, we are talking about all those three, uh, process, the three principles developed in the uh, recent past. We are talking about uh, 40, 50 years maximum. Uh, 
duty to remember again, uh, duty to remember, although it started, we have uh, first applications after the First World War, but actually it starts uh, only at the end in 78. Uh, Crystal Knight, uh, you know, this uh, idea, duty to remember, and it becomes, again, we are talking about a very specific context in which um, uh, human rights uh, practitioners are trying to understand. It's not enough, uh, you know, shaming and blaming. We need to have some concrete tools actually to deal with the uh, governments and to make them accountable. So, you know, there is a completely new vocabulary that is being reinvented and reimagined to be able actually to force, uh, to, to, to apply this uh, new morality. And then we have this uh, victim-centered approach that is super, super important, of course, I don't know, maybe you, you haven't paid attention, but uh, since the end of uh, uh, the Second World War, we are rarely talking about heroes. We are talking about victims, you know, victims uh, that is actually everything is centered. It has, again, very uh, distinct uh, historical sociological trajectory, how actually heroes became marginalized and now victims became actually understood as, uh, I don't have time, I need to make it short. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'll say just, and I will, yeah. So, uh, instead of going through all those three uh, principles, maybe just to connect it a bit more to a historical um, uh, uh, specificity, so facing the past again, uh, it, it was, uh, it is difficult to detangle it, but it is very, uh, directly connected to the historian's debate in, uh, in uh, Germany. So we see how the, this debate was, sorry, in the 80s, first debate, I should say, because the second is happening now, uh, that was all about, uh, you know, the uniqueness of, of uh, the Holocaust in, in uh, German uh, experience. It doesn't matter, it's a much, much, much bigger story. But it was all about, you know, those influences of uh, Theodore Adorno and uh, Margaret and Alexander Misterly, who were all about, you know, uh, facing the past uh, from different perspectives, but mostly from this psychoanalytical perspective that was super, super popular in Germany and became, especially in 1968, very uh, popular, this book, uh, uh, How Should We Mourn, uh, uh, by, by uh, Alexander and, and Margaret Masterlich, was a bestseller in the... Uh, 68, you know, biggest revolution. So there was this huge notion that we as a nation should face the past and this is going to, you know, this is how we are going to achieve some kind of catharsis and this is the only way to heal and this is the only... So the whole repetition of this uh, psychological uh, vocabulary. So this is facing the past. You need to remember, as I said, it has a completely different... Uh, uh, a trajectory, and it has to do with, you know, this notion of different rights. So we have rights as part of human rights, but we have also duties. So we, and we can, uh, again, you can find yourself uh, in any of those uh, positions, we as a community here have a, a duty to remember something that happened to someone else, although it didn't happen to us. So we need to, because it is a moral duty. And third thing, this uh, victim-centered approach, again, as you asked, uh, first of all, it developed after the Second World War, uh, uh, Raoul Hilberg, and he made this, but not only him, but this, you know, this uh, um, uh, triad matrix of uh, victims, perpetrators, bystanders. Victim perpetrators, but this is like, this became embedded within a human rights understanding of memorization uh, processes, and you cannot escape it. It has so many uh, fuck ups uh, with, with this uh, uh, <coughs> conceptualization because, uh, first of all, it says that all people in any conflict, within any political settings, should be placed in one of those uh, three categories. So it means it is very simplified. It, takes, it uh, takes away agency from people, especially from victims. And also it, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it, it actually uh, makes victims 
uh, forces them to be silent because they don't have any agency. You can act as a victim only if you fit to this matrix to be this ideal victim, you know. You have to perform your victimhood over and over again. There is nothing something like, but I want to be over with it. I want to move from there. No, but if you want to be in a status of a victim, and status I mean here both symbolically and, and uh, politically, you know, to get some benefits, you need to perform this uh, victimhood. And then, of course, uh, after this um, implementation of this uh, matrix of uh, uh, perpetrators, uh, uh, victims and bystanders, and by the way, after the Second World War, the whole notion of European memory is made from the position of a bystander, from a position we as a European Union can never be again in this uh, situation that we actually see like uh, we are not doing anything, whether we are talking about uh, Ukraine, uh, Srebrenica, I don't, of course that's, that is not true because they are very good at making uh, resolutions, but but it is made from a position of a perpetrator. Uh, and finally, it is actually developed uh, only in the 90s, uh, uh, rape victims uh, in Bosnia and the whole uh, application in uh, their testimonies in the trials, how it was very traumatic. So uh, there were NGOs who were putting actually uh, <clears throat> spotlights on those victims and, you know, saying we need to understand actually uh, conflicts and atrocities through their eyes. Again, there are many, many other, you can read it, it's a long literature how it developed. So, because I'm very, yeah, I talk too much, so I will, um, let me see just if there is many points I need to pick up. Yeah? Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, this is, I think, important. And maybe with that... Ah, no, I cannot finish with that because I have some other important things. But, okay, this is important because it is important to understand the difference between human rights understanding of memory and nationalist understanding of memory. And there is not enough... Uh, distinction between those uh, two. Uh, they're overlapping and they're uh, often um, uh, instrumentalizing each other, but th th there is a significant difference. First of all, to understand that, you know, nation state sponsored memory is everything that we have from history textbooks, uh, commemorations, national calendars, you know, something that is like a blind spot to us because we are we are living in through it, you know, you, you, you pay attention to it only when you move from one system to another and then you say, wow, this is weird that people are working on Sundays or something like that. So uh, it is very much a project through which nation state is homogenizing its population to become, you know, to form uh, the desired identity, okay? And it is very... Uh, in, uh, exclusive, you know, those boundaries should be very clear who is included, who can be Swedish, you know. This is uh, the, the idea what you do with those projects. Whereas if we talk about uh, human rights memorization agenda or this moral remembrance, we are talking about something that, has, that aspires to be global, to be transnational, to be, you know, to be very, exclu to be very uh, inclusive, not to set boundaries based on, on uh, gender, ethnicity, religion, uh, you name it. But actually, at the end of the day, it does do that, but through different means. Ugh, I will not get to it. I know that with quite. Um, okay. I can say only this one, but then I know it's not only this one. But okay, I would just mention the standardization of memory. I think this is super important because we are living in this era in which actually we are experiencing standardization of memory. We have memory standards as part of this moral remembrance. We actually have memory standards. I was blown away to find out that actually UN published uh, uh, in 2014 a very long policy report called memory st uh, memorization standards. So we have standards how we are supposed to remember things. You know, I was born, I always thought that each one of us has at least this uh, autonomy to remember 
the way we remember, but no, there are standards. So it means actually that we are living through this, uh, th through this uh, um, time of standardization of memory. That's why those, all those practices are very much alike. Uh, that's why we see the very same vocabulary all around the globe. That we think the same about those uh, issues, but it comes <clears throat> with a danger. Because once you have people being told how to remember, first thing is they're going to say, well, who are you to tell me? I mean, it is an oppressive process, actually. It doesn't matter who is uh, saying that, but it is coming from the outside. Someone is saying, you should remember this battle, this conflict, whatever, as X, Y, Z. But who are you to tell me how, you know, who is going to position? Even in, if I'm in your eyes perpetrator, in my eyes, I'm a morally, uh, it was justified to do that. I have, you know, set of reasons why it was good to do this. And you are now uh, saying for my moral act that I did something wrong. So there are all kinds of issues that we need to take into account when we have this process of standardization that is, again, bringing us closer to this uh, ethics and memory and is supposed to actually tell us how to remember. No, 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 no. Okay, just what is wrong with it, okay? This is the last one. Uh, first of all, this moral remembrance or this uh, human rights memorization agenda is actually using those uh, false presumptions that, for example, that uh, proper memorization can guarantee the establishment of human rights values and the possibility of reconciliation in conflict and post-conflict settings. Uh, just pay attention, the reconciliation is uh, also big paradigm, big trendy, 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 you know. We all want reconcili reconciliation. People just forgot to ask who wants to actually to have this reconciliation. You know, it, it, it feels like uh, parents uh, uh, that see their children fighting and you say you need to like uh, to come together and you know to say I'm sorry <sighs> Just you know instead of sending them to different rooms, but okay uh, so uh, the whole idea also that you can move from a and you will get to B and then it you're going to come in terms with some past, you're going to go out of this cycle. All those, all this vocabulary is actually uh, uh, um, making us think the way we think about uh, those processes. And actually it is not very established, I will not go into it, but if we even uh, talk about the, uh, about the Germany now, you know, that is the model of facing the past, we will see a shit show. So it's not really a, as it is. Also, what do we take, like 50 years, 100 years as a measurement? When do we say, yes, we nailed it, or now it's peace, or is it maybe 20 years, it's enough to say we have peace and that's all. So there are many issues with that. Again, uh, sociological explanatory models of therapeutic uh, discourses of pathology. This is very important, you know, because in a westernized uh, uh, understanding, uh, silence is a threat. Silence, it means that you don't talk. And if you don't talk, you're either in denial, you are actually hiding something. And we know uh, we have here someone who wrote a wonderful article about uh, silence as communication that can, that can be all kinds of things. It is not just something that is like, uh, no, it means if you're, if, you, if you're not talking, it means that you're, in that you're the bad person. Because this is how we conceptualize, again, uh, verbalization. Because verbalization is very much a uh, westernized uh, uh, concept to pr process uh, different things. Uh, then it creates new social uh, inequalities. It creates this... A system of hierarchies of victims, and it deepens actually feelings of injustice because you suddenly have like uh, ideal victims, uh, moral victims, better, bad victims. Uh, you know, uh, there is a whole typo typo typology of uh, uh, victimhood, like who, who are those deserving victims? Uh, and uh, again, I will not go into it, but the whole politics around it, how states are actually allocating uh, uh, resources differently 
uh, differently to different uh, victim groups just to make them, you know, to make, uh, to kind of cut them into different groups and to actually to promote again this uh, uh, animosity between them. So there are many ways actually that uh, this um, uh, moral remembrance in day-to-day -day politics is actually producing a new social inequalities. And at the end, it is cementing uh, social and ethical animosities. I didn't touch that because I don't have time, I will, uh, but maybe we will talk about it uh, later more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ah. Pay attention, pay attention. If we uh, get into a train that is not getting uh, into our direction, we will never get uh, uh, on the right station. That was the, the idea behind it. <laughs> Thank you, Leah, for this. So now we open the floor for questions, remarks. Thank you for this vivid talk. Um, you stated in the beginning that you were, were, will provide us with a critical analysis, and you certainly did. But I think you owe us some constructive analysis too. What should we do about it? Because you're right when you say that we often use a kind of immoral remembrance. Remembrance is national. Uh, remembrance is standardized. The Holocaust narrative, for example, is very, very strict with a lot of taboos, very far from scholarship on the Holocaust, which is very vivid. But there is a kind of, of standardized version, uh, which is, I think, very dangerous. But what can we do about that, except talking about it, communicating our different narratives on, on atrocities of many kinds? I just want to, uh, it is going to be recorded. It's here, here it says, what can we do? It is going to be the first question. So just to be sure that this was uh, 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 well uh, uh, anticipated. <laughs> okay, I've been asked that question at least 20 times now, so until now I, uh, I like, as a like, as smart person, I should come to some kind of uh, good answer, but I don't have a good answer, and I'll tell you why. I think that the first step is actually to understand those blind spots through which we actually understand today those processes. I think that before we jump to say, but if not that, uh, uh, just to be sure, I mean, this, what I'm saying here, uh, pushes many buttons. I, I know that I experienced that uh, on my own skin, so I know that many people will have problems with this approach. That's why I'm also stating at the beginning what is my, my discipline and what are my lenses. Just to be sure that if, uh, if I would approach to this uh, through uh, activism, I would be saying something different, okay? Uh, and I would be saying that not everything is black uh, and uh, there are many nice examples and we can learn so much, uh, da, 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 da. okay? So that, uh, that and it, it means it is not or this or that. They can, they can coexist together. But again, first thing is to understand that we are very limited with our uh, imagination and that we became limited through those processes that are really purely historical and sociological, but we adopted that as a, you know, as a genes, as a second skin. We, we cannot think uh, without those terms. So let's start, I say, from there to try to, you know, just to, to take this off and to see what are other resources available there. You know, maybe for people who suffered is uh, better to climb on uh, Himalaya than to go to a shrink. Maybe it is better for different communities to do gardening than to, you know, make oral history. I don't know, it is very individual. But one thing is uh, very, very important here. 
They cannot be a blueprint. We cannot say, oh, we know now in Northern Ireland we have this success. Mm, this is good. Let's export this model to someone because lessons learned. Everything that becomes that starts with lessons learned, I just want to you know to to, to throw it away. Again, I'm exaggerating. You see, that I'm a very exaggerating person. But uh, uh, it is we cannot. I mean, because there is a politics about NGOs, how they are going to get new funding, and their trends, and how actually grants are being uh, uh, given to what is now trendy. You know, but it is wrong. It because will not. It will not. At the end, or we should start uh, differently. Each of us, with each different position, has a different end ga a game here. What do we see? What do we want to see? What do we think should happen? So what is for us as researchers, it's not the same for someone who suffered. And it is not the same. We would like to, see, to think, yes, it is the same. But actually, it is, we, we, are consider, we are concerned about the different processes. So I can talk about, uh, without saying much uh, endlessly, but you understand the point. I don't have a good answer, but I think the right thing to do is to start talking about those things. We have yet another. Thank you so much, Leo. I was so happy that I get the chance to, to listen to you here today, and uh, very invigorating. Um, and you know, I share lots of your concerns about these uh, top-down narratives and discourses that are being put on, into societies in this way. But I still want to challenge you, and uh, I think that these discourses have become much more multidimensional over just the last few years. I also think that when you say that victims sort of perform their victimhood, well, I'd like to challenge you by, when you say that, I feel like you are actually taking away the agency of these victims, because I think victims have many, many ways of practicing memory. And I think from Marianne's presentation, for example, we can see that people do memory in lots and lots of ways that are sometimes uh, in line with uh, these big narratives, and sometimes they're not. And I think the lens that you're using now might be sort of leaving that out of the picture. No, I mean, you're right. You, of course you're right. Uh, there are all kinds of, and it is uh, multidimensional. But I'm talking about, you know, you need to, uh, if you bring to, together freedom, uh, and victimhood, uh, often there is a big tension because uh, victims uh, uh, cannot perform that kind of freedom because of the constraints that are very earthly. You know, I need to eat, I need to have a job, I need to have an access to uh, b benefits, grants, you know. So how you, do I do that? Uh, I do it through uh, different organizations. And once uh, you're in organization, you have to align yourself and self-censor yourself to be able to actually uh, get uh, uh, something, uh, some kind of trade-off. It doesn't mean that simultaneously the same person will not practice, so to say, something else. But again, the freedom is not always there. So there is, not all, there is no choice always. I mean, it would be an ideal uh, to say, okay, let's all of us or victims or whoever, whatever you feel, let's... Uh, give uh, enough space for each one of us to feel or to, to communicate it the way we want to do it. But it, often it's not the case that we have this uh, privilege. Challenge accepted. <laughs> More questions? Remarks? Well, it's been a long day, so I can understand that we all want to rest. I would like to thank you, Leah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.